Good evening, friends. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here to this evening's lecture by my friend and colleague, and Bina Das. When we decided that the theme of this year's Mellon Seminar on Violence and Nonviolence at the Mahindra Humanities Center would be devoted to the subject of everyday violence, we immediately knew that Bina's presence would be crucial. As you recall, last year we worked on violence and nonviolence in the conditions of war. And next year, the third year of our Mellon Seminar, will be devoted to what I call slow violence, ecologic, ecologic erosion, changes in labor practices, other forms of subject formation over a long period of time, the ways in which affect eats into the structures of everyday life. So next year will be slow violence. This year, everyday violence. And I absolutely knew we needed Vina with us. Vina Das is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Anthropology at Johns Hopkins. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the Academy of Scientists from Developing Countries. Her honors and awards include honorary doctorates from the University of Chicago and Edinburgh. Among her most recent books are Life and Words, Violence and the Descent into the Ordinary, and Affliction, Health, Disease, Poverty. Despite Vina's <clears throat> distinguished professional accomplishments and her significant disciplinary innovations, I warmly welcome her to Harvard today in a kindred spirit of wondering, wandering, and waiting. Vina's profound immersion in texts, ethnographies, and everyday life is done with the watchful eye of the angler. Vera introduces a fine fishing line into the waywardness of wind and water, waiting and watching for the world to take bait. The angler sees with her hands and her eyes, and in the ordinariness of time, suddenly she lands a catch. Big fish, small fish, it doesn't much matter. Scale, of course, is a matter of complexity, not a matter of big and small. Vina's acts of attentiveness, rather than intervention, make for a beautiful play of gravity and grace, of patience and purposiveness in the making of the work and the world, as we have seen it in book after book. I have chosen to introduce Vina by way of an extended metaphor, because her lecture today illustrates her ongoing interests in the exemplarity of the ordinary. There is present in her work the ethnographic impulse to define a condition, the ethical imperative to make a case for suffering or poverty or violence. But beyond all else, there is the desire never to disturb the opacity of the everyday through the straitjacket of academic protocols or disciplinary boundaries. Vina is the diagnostician of those blurred concepts and conditions that Wittgenstein taught us to tirelessly work with rather than hurriedly work through. There is both an aesthetic and ethical stance in reversing our order of thinking through exemplarity. Exemplarity is not simply illustration or typification. It is the method by which the instantiation of a way of life or a train of thought is stilled in the midst of what is otherwise spectacular or eye-catching. To do so is to register out of time and place the small incremental temporal shifts and the crystalline complexities that give the ordinary its depth, its definition, and indeed, its defiance. It is such an angling with the ordinary and its distinctive angles on the everyday condition of violence that will be the subject of Vina's lecture today. Let me end with a few lines from a personal correspondence between us. 
you know, wrote to me the other day, I try to show that our valuation of the evanescent as against the durable assumes that fleeting moments are of no importance unless they crystallize into something harder with sharp boundaries. I then try to understand the way violence might be expressed through resonance with ordinary language with which every particle could take one to another scene, that of violence which can only be expressed as half-truths, appearing like bubbles and disappearing before they can be caught. Did Vina say caught? Did I start with a little story about the everyday as the daily catch? I'm delighted that after Vina's lecture, we will be joined for some thoughts by Vina's long-term friend and collaborator, Arthur Kleinman, the Esther and Sydney Rapp Professor of Anthropology at Harvard. What Vina and Arthur share above all else is an ethic of care. Care is a meticulous attention to the circumstances of others, their lives, their works, their words, their choices, their judgments, to ensure that the business of life, its satisfaction and survival, places us side by side with what really matters, to borrow a phrase from Arthur. Friends, in the midst of the ordinary, I welcome you to an extraordinary evening. Thank you, Vina. Thank you very much, um, Homi, for inviting me and for that um, wonderful introduction. Um, I have to start by saying that there's some kind of elf of perversity which seems to um, guide my um, writing and speaking. Um, so every time I'm somewhere where I should be giving something which is much more finished and thought through, um, I end up by trying to give something that I've been um, trying to work very hard to, um, to understand and which kind of continues to elude me. Um, but one of the great advantage of being among friends um, is that you can precisely take risks of that kind and what you give back in some ways, um, even and particularly when um, these are um, strong criticisms, um, actually then really begins to reverberate and it produces, um, at least it produces a certain next step, if never uh, something more than a next step. So, um, I should say that this paper goes um, along with a, um, a larger uh, paper on the notion of uh, the ordinary, which is called What Does Ordinary Ethics Look Like, um, which uh, will be the subject of discussion uh, tomorrow. Um, and uh, in some ways, um, the question of ethics and the question of everyday and violence are very strongly tied up for me. So I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity to um, um, to try and put some of these thoughts um, forward. So we start with the assumption, which I'm sure everybody will agree, which is that the concept of the everyday and the concept of violence um, are not really um, transparent. Uh, and that by definition, if we start with the idea uh, that both everyday and violence have blurred boundaries, then one of the very big tasks before us would be to sort of try and think how do we imagine um, how to track something like the everyday and how to track violence. So I start from, um, uh, from some discussion as Homi anticipated from um, philosophical investigations uh, where we find the compelling idea that when we think of concepts as procedures or char characteristic expressions we, we live with or that grow out of life, 
we don't choose them through a set of possibilities. Rather, as Wittgenstein says, the concept forces itself upon us. When shown a line drawing of a rudimentary face and asked, this is from Wittgenstein, what you see, the answer, this is a face, is given at once, not treated as one among several possibilities. Even if one thinks of the picture, even if one thinks that one has seen the picture for the first time, um, or even if we say that First, we see it as this and then. It is difficult, Wittgenstein says, to think of it as a question of fixing the concept. Um, of course, one might say that in a different context, say you are examining a patient with a neurological disorder uh, in which the patient does not recognize faces. I don't know if there are such disorders, but if there is such a disorder, then one might say that the need for defining the boundaries of a concept do arise. Concepts in this formulation are not embodied in words, or not in words alone, but might either be embodied in any kind of linguistic equipment, that is words, sentences, texts. Uh, so there is a very interesting tendency by which we um, assume that when we're thinking about concepts, we're actually trying to find words. Um, and the traditions I will grow, I will draw out of, of course, uh, were traditions within which uh, people could break each other's heads on uh, whether the word was primary or the sentence was primary. And so in some ways, there is this question of which kind of linguistic equipment would we be drawing on. But more than that, it's also that uh, it's really the background of things that makes ordinary procedures through um, various kinds of um, uh, activities through which life with the other is lived possible. And I argue that it is the internal relation that language as a whole, including gestures and physiognomy of words, bears to the world that provides the soil from which concepts are grown. Accordingly, rather than started by defining what are the boundaries of the everyday, let us accept the opaqueness of this concept and ask fairly simple questions, such as what does the everyday look like, or the ordinary look like, or violence look like? If such words have a use, as Wittgenstein reminded us, it must be as humble a one as that of words such as table, lamp, door. If then concepts have vitality, this must be drawn from the life they participate in and not from the desire for abstract reasoning alone. There are cases in which abstraction might be at stake within a form of life, but this is to be shown in each case. Wittgenstein asks us to step, step aside from our usual procedures of finding words or propositions that are weighty enough to be treated as super concepts and then like a net thrown into the swirling waters of life to catch whatever fish we can. Instead, the ethnographic task is to show in what concepts of the everyday violence, moral, or ethical emerge in life, just as the concept of chair might emerge only in relation to new body techniques of sitting, the valuation of the above and the below, sitting on the chair versus sitting on the floor, as in societies with masters and servants, and the whole apparatus of producing and selling of chairs. As a way of taking these thoughts forward, let me start with the idea of the ordinary as the kind of concept that Wittgenstein was alluding to. But we might then ask, where would one look for the ordinary? Does the ordinary always have the appearance of the ordinary? Asking such questions about the ordinary takes us to an important characteristic of everyday life, namely that its very ordinariness makes it difficult for us to see what is before our eyes. Hence, we need to imagine the shape that the ordinary takes in order to find it. This could be the shape of the ordinary as the domestic. It could be the shape of the ordinary as marriage or as the neighborly or as having the rhythms of the diurnal in the form of repetition. Depending on how we conjure the everyday, the threats to the everyday will also be seen in relation to this picture of the ordinary. If, for instance, we take marriage and domesticity as pro providing us with the image of the ordinary, 
Then the threats might be seen through doubts about the fidelity of the partner, e.g. in Othello. If we see the ordinary as habitation within a world in which we dwell in a taken for granted way, as an animal lives in its habitat, then the threat might be seen that our existence might become ghostly, Hamlet, losing that natural sense of belonging. If the everyday is seen in terms of precarious order secured through contract between warring men, such as Hobbes, then the threat will appear as the sexualization of the social contract. The figure of the abducted woman, for example, as I analyzed in 2007. Framing all these pictures of the everyday is the idea that everyday is a site on which the life of the other is engaged. But this is not some kind of Levinasian big other. It's much more the question of in what kind of way is the life of the concrete other engaged. But as each of the example of the imagination of the everyday that I have given shows, violence in the everyday comes to be conceptualized primarily in relation to a scene of spectacular violence, such as homicide, suicide, massive sexual violation of women. Each of the cases corresponds to that. We may say here that the concept of violence forces itself upon us. I mean, it's not as if we have to choose in relationship to spectacular violence whether there is violence or not. Yet the category of violence is no more transparent than the concept of the everyday. For all the acts of violence mentioned here, the ordinary and the extraordinary are knotted into each other. After all, we do recognize the facts of sexual jealousy of the feeling of uncanniness in our own bodies, the fact that someone's voice has become ghostly, appearing from where it does not quite belong. So a first picture of the violence of the everyday might well be that in which we are thrown in the middle of an event of spectacular violence. At least that's how it happened to me, that for a long time I did not recognize that the kinship that I was studying was in fact a, embedded in a certain kind of violence that completely escaped me, till in a certain sense other events began to force themselves upon me, and that made me relook at the question of what was it that I was actually studying. Um, so, the first picture of the, web, of the violence, everyday violence, might well be that in which we are thrown in the middle of an event of spectacular violence, for example, partition of India, the Bangladesh War of Liberation, the various kinds of uh, wars and massive displacements, and now, for example, pictures of planetary extinction, um, which in a certain sense make the concept of violence force themselves upon us. But the question for me is that if this is the only way in which we were to understand everyday violence, then there are some set of questions that we can ask. And I think these are very important set of questions that one can ask. But it also asks us to see whether there are other forms of violence which are so distilled in the everyday. Uh, I call them later uh, processes of um, uh, signification without symbols or nameless significations. Um, which are so, um, uh, you know, so pervasive in the everyday that there is no easy way of finding a, significant, finding a symbol through which they can actually be captured. Um, so, um, so the first question that it seems to me, this scene of violence where the everyday is stitched to the event, um, leads us to ask one kind of question to the everyday, which may be, how does the violence of the event fold into the everyday? Is the event here in the nature of the violence to the everyday? So that we have two parts of it. One is really the idea of violence of the everyday, but there is also a sense of violence to the everyday. And um, one of the first questions that we might ask is how does the event fold into the everyday? Um, I give you uh, some ethnographic examples over here. Um, I mean, this, is be, this was the, the primary uh, motivation in a certain sense of the manner in which I constructed um, um, uh, life and words and violence and the descent into the ordinary, 
uh, which was in a certain sense a question really of how this very large event of the partition, even 20, 30, 40 years afterwards, you know, what were the shadows um, that were cast on the everyday and in what kind of way very ordinary expressions embodied this particular notion of the violence of the partition, even when it was not directly spoken about and especially when it was not directly spoken about. The example that I give you here is from uh, uh, Nainika Mukherjee's um, very recently published book called The Spectral Wound, uh, which relates to the uh, Bangladesh War of Liberation. And she's describing um, here how um, one of the Birangunas, that is, these are the women who were raped uh, during the uh, War of Liberation, um, and uh, Bangladesh had declared them to be Birangunas, that is, war heroines. Um, and Nanika Mukherjee tries to track both the nature of publicity around the Birangunas and how this publicity was carried into their everyday life. So she says, here is how Moina, one of the Birangunas, describes the experience of having been recognized and honored by the Sheikh's daughter in a public event to break the silence of the massive rapes and to publicly acknowledge the role of the Biranganas as freedom fighters. So she says, one day when I sat talking with Moina, a stray dog which had come for food started scraping the ground with its paws. Pointing to the dog, she said, Je bhabe e kuttata achrai che, she bhabe amader achriye koral. Like the way this dog is scraping the ground, we were also scraped, combed, and brought out. The poignancy in Moina's voice in this excerpt reflects her experience of being found, made visible by scraping, by achriye, being searched for and scraped out in the 1990s. This experience of becoming a nationally known Birongana, along with the experience of rape in 1971, became intrinsic to her everyday life. Differently spelled, the verb achriye, achurna, can mean scraping, scratching, searching, as well as the act of combing hair, combing through hair or testimonies to find information, and also combing hair over to hide the face or a wound on the head. So how does the ordinary then stand up to the horrific? Here is a picture of everyday life itself having been made poisonous, not only by the event at the moment of horror, but primarily by what happens to the sorry, how it is traded, and the women are made khota, uh, which is soiled from being biranganas. This is how uh, Mukherjee describes it. Villagers in Anathpur would explain to me that when they had heard about the rapes in 1971, they had nothing to say. And there were no social sanctions against the women because they knew that this violent sexual encounter was forced, a tragedy that could have befallen anyone's family. However, today, since the women are seen as talking about something that is a public secret in Anathpur, many villagers have deployed sanctions against them. The event of rape and above all the women's perceived intentionality of talking about it publicly makes them not heroines but sinners who have consequently lost their positions as moral persons. Ambiguities of revelation and concealment indispensable to the operations of power ensure that rape remains concealed as a secret, a public secret known but not articulated. People cannot overtly, overtly narrate it, only invoke it at a specific moment in intersubjective dynamics through scorn. Scorn thereby provides the framework for the memory of rape in Anathpur. Rather than a prejudice towards the rape woman per se, the process of revelation and concealment highlights the villagers' mixed feelings about the national exposure of the known local history of rape during the Bangladesh war. Listening to these voices from Anathpur, and also from the words of the, listening to words of women I befriended over a long period of time, made me see that rendering the violence as traumatic memory would touch on a very different register than the notion of poisonous knowledge. 
While in both there is a concept of the past that is reanimated in the present, poisonous knowledge brings the past forward as embodied knowledge and not through the return of the repressed. So how is poisonous knowledge absorbed? Which is the second question. So one is how is everyday life itself made poisonous? And here it's very interesting that it's not the, it's not the fact of rape itself. And this was, um, this was an argument that I made in um, Life in Words too, um, that a particular form of protection that was offered was actually to protect the women from publicity and that the, the, the desire in a certain sense to have the women counted and returned uh, back to the country uh, contradicted directly with sometimes with their own desire to, um, uh, you know, to, to let what had happened be. Uh, and for the families to try and offer protection by not talking about uh, by, by, by not talking about it, that doesn't mean these were nostalgic, beautiful pictures of care and um, uh, in you know care and the uh, resilience of the everyday. Uh, they were pictures of a very compromised everyday, but nevertheless, they were pictures in which women could live with these particular pictures. So I revisit one of the figures that I discussed. Um, this was the figure of uh, uh, Asha, uh, who was this woman who made the first widow remarriage in the upper caste um, Hindu families that I was studying. Um, and I described over there how um, uh, the, the, it was not so much, uh, Asha, was, Asha escaped uh, any direct uh, sexual violence, but the corrosion of the family relationships that followed um, created the absolutely unbearable situation for her in which her, um, you know, in which her, um, her husband's um, uh, dead, uh, husband, sister's husband who had given them, uh, given her shelter, um, began to um, um, express his own sexual desires towards her. Um, and she found this fact completely unbearable, both because she said that she could not stop herself from responding, and also because she felt that it was a complete betrayal of her um, dead sister, sister-in-law, who had been extremely kind to her when she came as a young bride. And so she um, arranged to get married to a, uh, married to a widower, uh, but I described in Life and Words how she never thought of it as a full marriage. That is, she always thought that in the eyes of God, she was not really married to him. She, decided, she described it as two ships meeting in the middle of a stormy sea and then um, uh, standing apart, moving apart. And what is very interesting, what I had found extremely uncanny, was that a whole life that had been lived with this man, in a certain sense, could be described as simply a moment. Um, in which, in terms of a later eternity, she would rejoin with her, with her husband. And I argued that, um, that in some ways what this um, reflected was um, her sense of uh, needing to repair the ongoing relationships with the women that she felt had become completely corroded, as well as with one of her, um, one of the children whom she had, um, whom she had been given in adoption. When I reread this, I was very struck by the fact that I used the word choice. I said, Asha made the choice. And now, 15 years later, when I read the text, it seems to me that I, uh, that I would not have probably used the word choice. It said, once a sexual being was recognized in the new kind of gaze, someone in the position of a surrogate brother revealing himself to be a lover, she was propelled into making a choice. Would she wish to carry on a clandestine relation and participate in the bad faith upon which Bourdieu recognized the politics of kinship to be based? Or would she accept the public opprobrium to which she subjected the family honor for a new definition of herself, which prompted a certain integrity, although as an exile from the life project she had earlier formulated for herself? Fifteen years later, it seems to me that the word choice suggests that there were two commensurate alternatives. Then this was not a good word to have taken to render what she described. Let us listen once again to her words. 
I've been very happy, very lucky that I found someone good to marry me. If Jijaji had not begun to make passes at me, I might have lived an ascetic life appropriate to a widow in my husband's house. But after what happened between us, how could I have faced my sister-in-law? How could I have faced my husband in my next life? With him, it is a connection for eternity. With my present husband, it is like two sticks brought together in a stormy sea, the union of a moment and then oblivion. I must confess that the image she conveyed in these words was uncanny. A lifetime spent with a man whom she had looked after, to whom she had borne two children, was like a meeting of two sticks in a stormy sea, simply because she was not, in, not his rightful wife in the eyes of God. Surely this is not easy to render as a choice she made, if we think that this implies that the alternatives are somehow commensurate, or that what is at stake here is to choose between obligation and freedom. There is a moral picture of the world here that also made her own present life somehow opaque to her. And yet, in the small act she performed in keeping fidelity with her sister-in-law and in continuing to visit her adopted son with whom she had a special relationship, despite all the veiled insults about her marriage from the same brother-in-law who had awakened her own sexuality, I saw a devotion to the world she could have just as well left behind. Should she just call this ethics of being together rather than an ethics of the act that can be isolated and judged? And so this is, I think, something fairly uh, interesting and important to me, which is really that um, in a certain sense, uh, there is both a certain opacity of her own life to herself. And that led me to think that it was not as if one can make a very clear contrast between thinking that here is a first person perspective of her own marriage, and then there is a third person perspective of her marriage, but rather that this opacity of the self, per of, of, of the first person in a certain sense pervades um, in her story. And I will have more to say on that, but I want to, um, I want to shift to, um, uh, to, to the next set of questions, which are, um, uh, which is the question really now of um, 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 yeah. Um, so, given this, that it seems to me that one, uh, so the two questions that I tried to show was first that if we think about the everyday violence as becoming revealed only in relationship to spectacular violence. And that has been, I think, the thrust of most of the studies that I have seen, which is really that what makes it explicit is the fact that spectacular violence allows for uh, the everyday to be opened up and to be, um, uh, and to be made visible. Uh, then the two questions were really how does this spectacular events, rather than concentrating on the moments of horror, I try to see how horror actually runs through the relationships. And I describe horror over here as, um, you know, as the fact that something like the features of someone who was absolutely close to you dissolve into becoming something else. And this is exactly what happened with Asha, which was really that she had to work very, very hard to try and restore the notion of her earlier relationship with her, um, with her own, with, with her sisters and with her uh, kin, whom she felt that um, uh, that this imagined relationship with her brother-in-law had betrayed. Uh, the second was the question that now I want to ask is, um, how does the ordinary stand up uh, to the horrific? Um, so, what I propose here is to first think about what kind of picture of destruction um, should we evoke. Um, I cite, um, I think, a, a, a passage that I have found extremely moving in um, Stanley Cavell's work where he's describing a picture of, of destruction, and he says, could it, that is the conceptual moment, he's really thinking about destruction over here and Wittgenstein saying uh, that all we have destroyed is a house of cards. And he's saying, what does it mean for Wittgenstein to have talked about his philosophy as being nothing more than having destroyed a house of cards? And he says, could it, that is the conceptual moment's color, 
have been evoked as the destruction of a forest by logging equipment, or a field of flowers by the gathering of a summer concert, or the march of an army. Not, I think, if the idea is that we are going to have to pick up the pieces and find out how and whether to go on. That is to go on living in this very place of devastation as of something over. So if you have a picture of a army marching through a um, garden of flowers, and the army doesn't have to ever look back at what they have destroyed, then that's one kind of picture of destruction. But every day is not, I mean, if we say that for every day, yes, of course, there are pictures of destruction of that kind in which the every day has been completely destroyed. But the second picture is something which is actually a very compelling picture, which is the imagination of the everyday itself as something which is always remade in this particular space of devastation, which means that it is always remade with what, what pieces of rubble um, and ruin are actually left behind. Um, The, um, so, um, so in some ways, the putting together of the everyday with spectacular violence both allows us to see how everyday violence might itself become, everyday life might become poisonous. It shows us how the poisons of the violence might be absorbed. It also shows us that we might reimagine the everyday itself as a certain kind of site in which there is always a remaking. It's never as if there is only a site of routine and repetition and then it gets destroyed but rather that the occupation of the everyday is a re-inhabitation in this particular scene of, um, scene of the ordinary. From this perspective then, if we ask ourselves, how is everyday life then joined to the event? It appears that the violence would have to be seen from this perspective as a diminutive form of the spectacular. And that's why concepts like, um, if people have used notions of event as something which comes from nowhere, then what is seen as interesting for everyday life is the notion of the quasi-event, which is that it's really something which doesn't quite rise up to becoming an event, unless it is made into an event by something like the eyes of the state. And Elizabeth Pavanelli gives us a very good example of that in which, um, you know, in which as she is describing these scenes of everyday violence, you suddenly see the language shift in which as if there is a camera now which has been focused on what is happening over there. And it is, she says, through these kinds of aggregations that the uh, quasi-event is made into an event. And I think this is a picture to hold on to. The problem with that is that what we then get in thinking about everyday violence is primarily um, in terms of pictures of accumulation, slow acts accumulate till they become very large events, morphing something like a, um, you know, like suddenly uh, um, in, in the areas where I study, uh, questions of a uh, Hindu girl eloping with a Muslim boy can suddenly become, morph into a spectacular act of violence. Uh, transfiguration, uh, something which was slowly, um, uh, slowly accumulating, and you could see the signs of that, for example, uh, in the names that people gave to, um, uh, gave to their children, which initially would be names that were respectful of not offending others who lived in the same neighborhood. And then you begin to see a shift in which um, deliberately names might be given which are supposed to be offensive um, uh, to the other group which is living in the neighborhood. 
Uh, these are again something which don't actually become visible till they erupt into something. And this is the picture in a certain sense of the violence of the everyday. And here the question becomes that from the extraordinary and the spectacular, how to return to the ordinary? And the question becomes like how can ordinary people have performed, um, uh, how can ordinary people have perform performed such effects? But the question that I want to raise is, so this seems to me like a, um, like a model of thinking about everyday violence, which has now become uh, reasonably well established. We don't now actually get ethnographies of violence in which the center is only describing, you know, what are a few horror stories and then letting that stand for a particular analytical apparatus. Um, we do get, I think, very interesting ways in which questions about the stitching of the event and the everyday, or the eventedness of the everyday, or the eventalization of the everyday has, you know, a, has, has become a very important apparatus of analysis. <laughs> the question that I want to ask next is that if we are, if we were to think of everyday violence not primarily on the model of the spectacular. Uh, how is violence that is so distilled into the everyday to be actually recognized? A lot of the time, one can see that violence of the everyday is seen to be striving towards the act of naming, whether as symptoms, as collective experience, as bad faith, as meconnaissance. And I will show what kind of paradoxes might result in a certain sense in this particular move. The primary paradox is really that, uh, you know, while the state or bureaucracy or um, uh, expert knowledge comes in over here, say from law, or from bureaucracies to name something as violence, which had not been recognized as violence. And I think this is very important moves that um, human rights groups perform. These are very important moves that public health personnel perform. Uh, but they lead to, the paradox is of course that they lead again to a certain way in which the integrity of the everyday is often destroyed. And I think we have not found any ways by which we can actually domesticate or tame that particular um, uh, consequence of uh, uh, naming these violence and acting upon it as violence. Um, so, the next question that I want to ask is, what does this picture of violence absorbed in the everyday as caught in the movement towards signification, naming, etc., conceal? Is there a way of rendering the everyday that might reveal another aspect? I think one could very well think about this in terms of the duck rabbit. Is this a case of aspect dawning? Is it that there is the everyday violence which is distilled and which is, stays like a current which has not been quite named? Along with the processes through which um, spectacular violence or violence of the everyday which is moving towards signification, which is wanting to be named, is you know, are these actually both present? And one might say that both are potentialities of the everyday, that it strives towards naming, and it also strives towards not naming. Um, what I attempt, want to do is um, to think of uh, what would it mean uh, to be able to capture this violence, not through the um, wonderful metaphor that uh, that Homi presented of uh, angling and fishing, um, but really by a sideway glance. That is, what would it mean to be able to say that I cannot actually glance at it directly, but like the barbarian women of Coetzee's novels, whether there is a sideway glance which might allow us to see something which we have missed. And here, the first thing that I thought about was the fact that everyday life has this kind of, or this, this particular picture of violence is embedded sometimes in a very form of language. So for example, when we think about Austin and his essays on diversity, on, on excuses and on pretending, uh, the diversity of excuse, excuses becomes the expression of the infinitesimal detail of human actions and capacity of disaster that they unfold. So three ways of spilling ink, 
or the fact that I might shoot your donkey by mistake or by accident, the fact that I might inadvertently step on a say, snail, but I should not say that I inadvertently stepped on a child. Uh, you know, all of these in a certain sense are, um, uh, are expressions in a certain way of the various ways in which human action can go astray, can go wrong. Um, so I, so, so the only sideway glance that I felt that one could look at to violence is really, in, in some ways, when it is um, uh, when it is not named, um, is to look at practices which look so ordinary and quotidian um, that you would not imagine that these are particular signs of violence. And I give you three examples over here. Um, one is uh, paradoxically an example from what does naming mean. The second is on how do we come across a command in everyday life. Um, and the third is the fact of how a particular manner of revealing the violence is also a particular form of concealing the violence. So I give you, let me just start with an example about names and the very quotidian manner in which issues around names come up, for example, in the field. Um, one of the families that I study, uh, that I've worked with, um, the, uh, the, the man's wife um, was called, um, uh, called Smriti, uh, which is a perfectly respectable name. It can mean um, the inheritance of uh, Vedic knowledge, not direct Vedic knowledge, but what is what is memorized. So not the high Vedas, but the uh, things like the Puranas and the Itihasas and so on, slightly lower forms of knowledge which come to us through memory. But in this case, she had been given the name Smriti because the man's first wife, her elder sister, had died in childbirth. And um, uh, you know, it was taken for granted that the obligation to look after the child and to be married to the elder brother would fall upon the younger sister. One might say this is a very conventional form of kinship. Um, except that I've heard women sometimes say that, you know, what is a woman? She is basically just a cow. If the husband dies and owner, you know, the owner dies, you pick up you know, the rope of the cow, you've tied it to that owner, and now you go and tie it this owner. And at one point when she became quite intimate with me, uh, she said she had never been sure in her life whether her husband ever saw her or saw only her elder sister. So there are, in a certain sense, it doesn't get taken any further. That is where it stops. And I think that, um, you know, this, this question of what does, it, what does it mean to live in that way in which um, both convention, in a certain sense, have uh, normalized a particular kind of marriage, but the experience of that is never just that this is a conventional marriage. It's also true that her um, first son uh, was born, um, who was born was called Shantana, um, which means uh, a consolation, um, you know, so that she was a consolation to her husband. I've um, similarly analyzed some of the mythic names, and if someone is interested, I'd be, you know, happy to. Uh, offer them, but these are uh, these are such names as the fact that uh, somebody like Draupadi um, has perfectly normal kinds of names like the daughter of Drupad, but she also has names like Yagiseni and Krishna, um, which is a indication of the fact that she was born as a residue of the sacrifice and that she was born to carry on the earth's desire to uh, lead uh, the two warring lineages to their destruction. And during her, her exile, she was called Srindharini, uh, which is basically a slave woman or a servant. Uh, and so that there is always behind this great princess this idea that she was really nothing else but a servant to the um, commands of the earth goddess. The second example that I want to take from names is a little more um, uh, difficult example. Um, this is the example in which um, a, uh, a woman who had, um, uh, whom again, who I'd got to know quite well, um, never spoke about um, her sexual violence. This was again a family uh, placed after the partition in 
um, in a relative's house. Uh, but it became very clear over a longish period of time of interaction with her that, um, you know, that she had been sexually abused by an uncle, but that the mother could not dare say anything because she was uh, a dependent relative. And as a dependent relative, she thought, she, she thought that her, um, um, uh, that, that her um, uh, sexual abuse was almost part of the bargain in which they were able to live there. The most interesting thing was that at one point she said to me that I can speak about these things, but I can never take the name of the man who violated me. And she said, it's because if I take his name, the world will become upside down. I mean, I don't have a good translation of it in Hindi. It's ke dunya uthal puthal ho jayegi. Um, and so in a certain sense, this idea that there is a name which is hidden, which is this alien name in you, which mm -hmm. comes to bite you from within, and that you cannot, it's partly the theme of poisonous knowledge, that she is containing this knowledge rather than the, allowing the world to go upside down. Um, but it's also a certain unspeakability of the name. Uh, and the third example that I have is of a woman who in a perfectly ordinary focus group discussion of the sort that public health people often like to have, um, we were participating in a, um, in a meeting and uh, the discussion was really about the government's plans for greater institutional births. Uh, and she said to me on an aside, she said, you know, I never call my husband. Um, she said, I have no children. And so I never can call my husband's Munni's father or Papu's father. Um, I actually tell people, if I have to send a message to him, I'll not say go tell Munni's papa this because I don't have a Munni and I don't have a Papu. Um, I will tell them, go and call Suresh. And I didn't understand fully the significance of the statement, but it was obviously a weighty statement for her. And then um, others explained to me that, um, and, and, and she began to talk about her experiences, and she said, it's not that I was childless. I had six pregnancies, uh, three miscarriages, and three children who were still born. And she said, by the time my fourth child was dying, it became clear to me that the, my husband could make me pregnant, but he could not invest even this much energy to try and see that my children lived. And so I visit a little bit of death on him every day, which is to say, because of this strong idea that a woman who takes the name of her husband um, uh, you know, takes away a bit of his life. So she was like, in everyday interactions, I actually visit a little bit of death on him. So these are, in ways, premised upon uh, some very, very uh, important ideas about naming. One of them is that by your name, you become a ransom to the other, which is shown by virtue of the fact that in grammatical rules, if you swear by somebody, that particular person is put into the, um, uh, into the instrumental case so that the person becomes your instrument. And there are huge discussions in both the Mahabharata and the Ramayana on, especially the Ramayana, on the question of who can swear by whom and what are the ways in which, by swearing on somebody, you have ransomed that person um, to uh, the vagaries of life. The second is, um, uh, is what is an everyday command. And this is again from the second woman that I described. Um, when one day she said to me that one of the most traumatic moments, one of the most difficult moments for me was when my mother was dying. And as she was dying, she said, um, you have a lot to forgive me for. And she said, I just felt that this was cruelty. This is the word she said. She said, you know, this was cruelty. Uh, because she said, I, if I said yes, I have a lot, you have a lot to forgive me for, then I'm assuming that you knew it all along, but you never acknowledged it to me that you knew that I was being sexually abused. If I say no to you, then what kind of a person am I that I cannot even forgive a woman on her deathbed? Mm. And it seemed to me very interesting that these kinds of forms of violence, which are absolutely lethal, actually cannot be named. They are really part of the whole um, texture uh, of life in which 
um, you know, they bubble up at particular kinds of moments and they remain like threads which continue through the more durable structures of life, but they, they are, they are um, what gives um, texture in a certain sense to life. So then the last point that I want to make is um, that if we then begin to uh, think what kind of theoretical structures might we actually draw um, from, um, I was actually very interested in the fact that um, it's both in um, Indian kinds of notions about, uh, especially in Sanskrit, about uh, significations which are without, um, without name. Um, this is something that the grammarians were, of course, totally obsessed with. So, you know, if you read somebody like Panini, the notion of loper, that which disappears. And so the crucial question really was whether absence was just something from which presence has disappeared, or was absence something in itself, which was, which was um, you know, which, 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 uh, which required uh, particular kinds of rules and regulations to think about absence in itself. Um, and I'll give you, um, uh, give you two, um, two particular examples of this, which is um, uh, one that in the sense of nameless significations, um, the theory of um, uh, aesthetic in which fundamentally the idea was that um, it's not purely figures of speech. This is the ninth century um, um, uh, aesthetic theories from Anand Vardhan and uh, his commentator Abhinav Gupta. Um, uh, you know, and it's poignant that I should speak about it because Daniel Ingalls was uh, someone who um, uh, translated the, uh, the whole of uh, Dhanya Lok and was always very, very, uh, I think, very enchanted by, uh, uh, you know, by these stories. Um, so I'll just give you two examples. One of the major questions for them was, how could we name an emotion love, or how could we name an emotion compassion or death, when no emotion actually comes by itself? That is to say, it's not as if, in relationship to love, you would not have the swirling affects of jealousy, anger, uh, violence, etc. And so why is it that they would say, why is it that the great poets were um, uh, great poets allowed death to come into the scenes of love? And Anand Vardhan's answer, which is a tamer answer, um, the example that they take is from Kalidas's Ajavilap, which is, um, you know, Ajas, it's a great poetry of lamentation. Uh, because his wife, who was a nymph, has suddenly disappeared because of a wrongdoing that he did. Um, but in the lamentations, there is always a shadow of the idea of an ultimate reunion, uh, of a reunion. Not expressed through any very big way, but through particles like Eva does, or, um, you know, or the use of a future tense rather than a past, which has completely been over. Um, and the, Abhinav gave a more sophisticated answer to that, where he said the question is that of memory. Was the overall texture of the composition one that left the impression of disenchantment or of the ability to endure the pain and sorrow entailed in love? So in that sense, it's, um, uh, and because they had a notion of, um, of language in which every every aspect of language could resonate. That is to say, a grammatical particle could resonate with a new meaning, um, the word could resonate with a new meaning, and therefore sometimes the whole passage is more about, um, um, you know, might be about sorrow um, or love, but a particular resonance within that might be of um, sorrow or violence. And I will say what the importance of that is, if you will allow me, with one uh, small example. Um, so this is um, Rama. This is supposed to be pure resonance, because not a single figure of speech is used in this. Um, so this is Rama saying, my mother sought to hold you back. You followed me in exile out of love. Who now without you, this is after Sita has been lost and he's um, lamenting uh, the fact that he can't find her. 
Uh, my mother sought to hold you back. You followed me in exile out of love, who now without you fades upon the horizon black with its new clouds. How hard this shows your lover's heart to be my love that he still lives. Um, this is from a, um, from a play that has been lost, and this is the only fragment which remains. And what the comment inter says is that although this is a scene of violence and uh, near-death scene, the fact that he's talking about your lover's heart to be my love makes these pronouns resonate with the idea that this is actually a scene which will resolve into love. And I think that what's very interesting to me is actually how something of this kind, act, you know, that in, we're not used to thinking about in our field work, finding um, resonances of this kind, but I began to collect ways in which these kinds of resonances come, and I'm happy to offer you, um, uh, offer you some examples. Um, but I think the general theoretical notion over here is the idea that everyday life will not present you with pure emotions in which you would say, ah, here is love and here is death, but that there would be resonances of the sort in which your experience of what is um, uh, love and what is death will be determined by, um, by very, very small kinds of resonances which are like things which accompany uh, the texture of everyday life. Um, do I have five more minutes? Yes, you can have five more minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, so I offer this to say that this complements in a way Austin's examples on the minute differentiations in language indicating the many ways we are prone to disaster. In Abhinav book, we might find an indication of how small participles of language hold the hope that a life can be made inhabiting this very vulnerability, not as an escape from this vulnerability, but something which happens within this vulnerability. Um, so I found very great resonances over here with, um, um, with some, uh, some current thinking within anthropology, uh, which I would like to draw your attention to. Um, so, uh, for years, Arthur Kleinman had um, um, expressed a certain disappointment that however uh, complex my ethnography might be, uh, it doesn't actually quite al allow us to see how a particular problem is to be resolved. And I completely accept that particular criticism and I want to take that further, but it's very interesting that um, that when um, Arthur turned to ethics of care, which he did not oppose to justice, he described this as a ritual of the everyday, in which he said violence and care were both, in fact, embedded. And so we have an absolutely extraordinary description um, in his saying that the process of coming to terms with what life brings, makes do, getting through, doing it in a way that is at times emotionally and aesthetically uplifting, while at other times barely endurable. It is the art of living, not necessarily always living well. So in one way, that's a certain kind of sense in which the, uh, you know, which resonates completely with the Sanskritist idea um, that the, that, you know, that there is no way, I mean, I'm not saying that they didn't have notions of living well, but it's very interesting how all the rhetoric which was presented could be completely dismantled through these very small resonances in which the question was how to live a life, not necessarily that you could live a life well. Um, and the second which uh, I was inspired to think about the, um, this question of then what kind of voice could we find in the everyday, that if the everyday is to be seen not just as something which stands in opposition to the um, to the spectacular, then what kind of voice could be found? Um, and I thought that there was something very interesting in Baba's call for a post-colonial semiology. Um, and I know that he's looked at Caribbean um, uh, writers in relationship to finding this, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, some hints of what a post-colonial semiology might be, in which the question of what is a pronomial I and a verbal vocal I is a very central question. 
Um, and this, it seems to me, that there is a question of widely scattered historical contingencies, but it leads me to think that there are actually very interestingly two paths which open up with reference to which we could think about everyday violence. One is the path, and these paths don't necessarily meet, um, but I would want anthropology to remain open to them. Um, whether the, uh, so, so in Bhava, this is a move to claim particular um, histories as the histories of the marginalized and the subaltern. And for me, I think it would be a very interesting question of a discussion of saying when are these histories to be claimed and what is it to let go of, um, of certain histories. Um, so the two parts, one towards naming, and I find it very uh, striking uh, in uh, a forthcoming book by uh, Orkide uh, Behruzan, uh, in which the idea of naming goes to name each generation. So that is Nasle Sakle, which is the burnt generation, Nasle Khamosh, the silent generation, Nasle Hazrat, the envious generation. And it seems very interesting to me that the idea that this kind of constant violence of the Iran-Iraq war, the, the, um, uh, uh, the, Ira the Islamic revolution, and the fact that everyday life was a life of duplicity um, comes to be expressed actually through this particular naming. And the other side might be in somebody like uh, Tara Pinto, uh, who argues that the categories of ethical evaluation, good and bad, collapse. Um, because it's not clear in her ethnography as to when is something care and when is something abandonment. And I think that this is a very uncomfortable position uh, in some ways to lead one to, uh, because all I've done is to say that there is a certain impasse at every moment that we come across. But I found that it's, um, uh, it's more honest of me to um, to say that there are these impasses than to be able to say that I can, one can actually present a model of the everyday which would be completely different from uh, its particular relationship to um, eventedness and to spectacular violence. But I would, um, you know, but I'm very drawn towards thinking that there are probably um, these semiologies which might lie not in um, or with my lie in several uh, directions, and one of them is actually a return in a certain sense to reappropriate uh, the kinds of texts that I have talked about. Um, so I will, will say the last question, which is that over the last few years, I've been looking very closely at the question um, of why it is that in thinking about everyday life, um, texts like the Mahabharat felt that um, you know, that the big categories like dharma and nonviolence and so on um, were actually too uh, profound to be able to deal with everyday violence. And they offered instead very diminutive categories like non cruelty. So, Wendy Raniger thinks that this was a kind of compromise by which the idea of, viol you know, of the great aspirations to nonviolence were lowered uh, towards um, non cruelty. Um, but essentially, the idea of non-cruelty um, uh, is really to accept the contingencies of fate. So one of the examples of non-cruelty given in the Mahabharata is this totally simple example of a parrot um, who lives in a tree, and the tree has been burnt by the um, um, uh, by, uh, by, the, uh, by the shooting of a hunter, and he refuses to leave the tree. And when asked why he does not go to a tree with more flowers and fruits, because no one would blame him if he left the tree, um, he says, fate has placed me with this tree, and so, uh, uh, you know, so I cannot abandon uh, the tree. And Indra presents that as the highest form of uh, non-cruelty. But it's also very clear that non-cruelty doesn't have the same kind of uh, majestic structure that, uh, you know, that dharma with a capital D would have or uh, non-violence would have, but it allows uh, them to critique in a certain sense the idea um, uh, of, mo uh, you know, of a certain kind of moral profundity for which the Mahabharata is a perfect answer because in effect it is an argument with gods about the impossibility of escaping violence. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mina. If you sit here, I'll... Thank you very much for this very thoughtful uh, talk. And what I think is um, would be conducive to a discussion is the various registers of the talk and the way it opens up uh, areas for the uh, for our intervention and our interlocution with you uh, is indeed the concept of naming the concept of command is always interlocutory. The concept of naming is, is, is always. So it's always an invitation to address or an invitation to be addressed. And I think that concept, as one of the framing devices uh, that you return to again and again, opens up a certain mode of uh, discussion amongst the audience. So you were really, in a way, interestingly interpolated us, hailed us in a, in a, in a very interesting way. Uh, I have several issues and questions that I would like to raise, but what I'm first going to do is to turn to the audience and ask for your questions, your issues, uh, to Vina. Please, um, um, uh, please, please name yourselves, please name yourselves, please introduce yourselves. I think I'm now going to say, please name yourselves, rather than please introduce yourselves. So please let me see a show of hands. Please introduce yourselves when you ask your question. And let us give uh, Vina precisely the kind of, precisely, vaguely, the kind of experience she has so generously uh, put forward for us. So let me see, have a show of hands. Where is? Yes, please. Uh, can we have a mic? Thank you. Diana Eck in um, Religious Studies, I guess you could say. I have a question that occurred to me as you were talking about, um, about not um, stepping inadvertently on a child, but uh, et cetera. And I thought, well, how does in inadvertence figure in violence? And I'm thinking here of the many, many instances in which violence is inadvertently uh, undertaken. For example, Dasharatha, at the outset of the Ramayana, who is he's just hunting, and you can't really say hunting and, or a, a king is a violent act, but he inadvertently shoots a child rather than the elephant that he thinks is filling the, you know, uh, drinking at the stream. And uh, that is a fleeting moment that lasts forever. I mean, in a sense, you could say it's inadvertent. Um, how, how do we think about those things? Because it, it, you know, it's somehow tied up with the idea that all of our actions, no matter what, have consequences for us. Yeah. And he's cursed, of course, by the, or I wouldn't say cursed, but he is told by the child's uh, parents, aged parents, as, as the child dies in their presence, that they too, or that he too, will die in separation from his uh, beloved son, and uh, indeed yeah. he does. So the, can I reply? Of course, of course. Uh, so the point about inadvertently was, of course, the idea that you can say I mistakenly stepped on the child. That was Austin's point. Uh, but that, you know, if you had, you wanted to go and tell the parents that something, you know, sorry, this has happened. You don't want to say, I inadvertently stepped on the child. You're going to say, I accidentally stepped on the child or some such thing, right? But your larger point is very well taken, um, you know, which is that really you get caught into this violence. And this is, this is the point, it seems to me, of the, um, of the fact that this moment, uh, you know, the point about the resonance that I made, this, po this moment in which you are inadvertently caught, you didn't intentionally want to, want to kill this child, although there's always a backstory, right? Um, I think that what's interesting is that when he's cursed and said, you will die of grief of, for your son in the same way as I'm dying, he first takes it as a blessing because he doesn't have any children, right? Right? 
And that, in a certain sense, is precisely what the text is saying. We don't always know what are curses and what are blessings, and we have to live through this as both a blessing as a curse. So only towards the end, when he has, um, you know, when Rama has had to uh, had had to depart and he he dies, um, does he then recall that it was in fact a curse? So the point that I'm trying to make is that. In a certain sense, a moment, which is, was the idea that of what does it mean to say that it, you know, it lives forever, is, is not something which is immediately transparent to us. That it takes a lifetime uh, to work out what a moment might, might have meant. Could, could I just ask one quick thing there? Which, but you see, yes, this example is of, of inadvertence. And it is also the implications, as you talk about them, are one on about responsibility without intentionality, and the other about memory. You know, the, there's, there's two ways in which. But the frame of this problem of in, inadvertence is either mythological, it's either a fable, it's a, it's a parable. Uh, how do you account, as you talk about these concepts, these fleeting moments. Aren't these fleeting moments framed by certain kinds of genres so that inadvertence in that particular illustration is not simply about a fleeting moment. It's about a fleeting moment translated or presented as a kind of lesson of some kind, as a way. So it's not just in itself what it is, but how we actually respond to it. So it may be a fleeting moment in itself, but as we think about fleetingness, it's also a kind of Wittgenstein point. As we think about fleetingness, we stay with it, we repeat it, we interpret it, we see it as allegory or metaphor. So I'm just interested in when we use texts like the Mahabharata, they have a particular genre, they have a particular set of interpretations. We can't just take the exemplarity out of them and say, you know, this is simply about inadvertence. This is an inadvertence in a certain representational frame. Yes, except, I mean, I would tend to disagree because, you know, one of the things that the Mahabharat actually does not do, for example, this thing, it's not supposed to be exemplary about that kings should not hunt or that you should not invert, inadvertently go and, you know, uh, shoot your arrow in a direction where he had mistaken the. Uh, the child's cry for the cry of a, of a deer, yeah. right? And really, it has no moral. Um, uh, it has no moral consequences for him. There are basically only the fact that there will be a contingent working out of fate. And so, what is it that a contingent working out of fate, which is perfectly consistent with the idea that if I have been placed with someone. This is a completely non-contractual obligation when the dog follows Yudhishthir and Yudhishthir cannot abandon him. It's not that he has contracted with him anything, right? And so these are not, I mean, what is interesting about the Mahabharata is precisely that, I would argue that even for the Ramayana, that it is actually um, not exemplary moments which have a lesson, because that for my understanding of this is actually too, um, too moralistic or something. I'm not saying you're being no, moralistic, no. but I'm saying that the idea that they have a lesson has a particular history of a particular yeah. genre, right? Whereas here, this is, they're not really trying to give you a lesson. They're trying to give you a way of saying, uh, you know, how, how would you think about uh, uh, entering a particular debate? Yeah. Right? right. Which is not like, this is the lesson for no, no. you, but how would you enter into this particular yeah. debate? And people do. I mean, you know, this is the interesting thing, that if you look at the Gond Mahabharat, it will take a moment of that kind and say, uh, not the Ramayana, but say the Mahabharat, which will you know, take a moment of that kind and take the story in a completely different direction. right? And that potential is supposed to be there in every character in the Mahabharat. Yeah. Mine was yeah. not about the moralism. Mine was about the actual framing of what of what this lesson is. But let me say, yes. you know, what does it mean to think with it? That yes. was my yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Michael Hertzfeld, Anthropology. Um, thank you, Vina. That was a, a marvelous uh, talk. Um, I want to move the conversation about inadvertency 
uh, from the textual to the ethnographic, yeah. because I think that's where you situate yourself uh, much more specifically. And I want to take you out of your familiar territory and into mine. I, I'm remembering an incident uh, many years ago in the village where I worked in Crete, where um, my landlord, who was also the village president, asked uh, his uh, sister's son, so therefore a member of a different lineage, different clan, um, to give him a tow uh, down to the city. And the son had been out raiding sheep, and he was completely drunk and exhausted, uh, the, the nephew, I'm sorry, and he said, no, I can't do it, and the uncle insisted. So eventually, because the uncle was a senior person, they went off, and at a very bad moment on the road, the rope between the car and the tow uh, snapped, and the uh, nephew went over the edge and was killed, and at the last minute, the uncle was able to get himself clear. Immediately, the members of the, um, of the uh, uh, nephew's clan began to call for revenge. And this is a society where actually killing for revenge is quite common. Now, to me, as an outsider, the really, the really extraordinary part about this was that the uncle had simply asked for a favor and had not considered himself to be doing anything particularly violent. And the accident obviously was inadvertent. From the perspective of some of the villagers, anyway, this was not an accident. And because the uncle had been the proximate cause of death, he was the one who had to take the responsibility. So it seems to me that when you actually move into a specifically ethnographic situation, there are two questions that are implicit in what you presented, but I didn't actually see you address them directly, and I wondered if I could get you to talk about them. One is the cultural construction of inadvertency. That is, what is it that makes something appear to be inadvertent? We think we know, but we know partly because we're operating with cultural rules of interpretation. And the other is, to what extent does the gossip that says, well, he's only accusing this man because he has some political advantage, to what extent is that itself a form of violence? What, to what extent are those words uttered against a man who's just lost his nephew in an accident for which he feels responsible, now becomes the object of, uh, actually did become the object initially of attempts at assassination? So to what extent are the words violent, and to what extent is the inadvertency itself the, the, the result of a purely cultural happenstance, if you will. Thank you. So uh, I think that's a very interesting example because you know one can multiply it and one finds this sort of a thing all the time that there's a so it's um, so that way it's a very nice example because it speaks to a whole lot of different things. I mean, my main interest is not to give a judgment on whether this is violence or not violence. You know, I'm neither competent to do it, nor is it ever clear to people themselves as to how will something grow to become violence or grow not to become violence. So, so in the areas I work, for example, I mean, if there is a um, if there's a girl who um, uh, who runs away with uh, let's say a Hindu girl kind of running away with a Muslim man, uh, there would immediately be these calls on both sides to say, you know, kill him, kill her, etc. And there's huge amount of effort put into, you know, there'll be some other relative who will squirrel them away so that they can avoid that particular scene of uh, uh, you know, that particular scene of confrontation. Before they run away, they would have gone to the police station and left, a, uh, you know, and left a letter stating that they are, the girl is going voluntarily, she's not being abducted. Um, there would be friends who would have gathered enough money for them to move from one hotel to another hotel to the third hotel. I have one case where the mother confronted the RSS and said, you know, you have everybody else who can do your Hindu stuff, but I have only one son, right? So it's never just a question of someone standing apart and giving an evaluation. It's a matter, and I think Steve's work on Yemen Chronicles shows that very well, 
uh, you know, of the opacity of what is happening. And so the fact that neither the anthropologists nor, you know, people are actually totally clear. I will say, though, that there is a um, sense which in this larger paper that I have I have tried to do, which is in some ways that yes, these are cultural conventions, but in these cultural conventions, there's also a notion of what is it, you know, what 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 is life? What is it to be a human in this particular corner uh, of humanity? So um, you know, so on the text, I have to say that um, part of the reason for evoking them is that I think they're very powerful theoretical structures. So I don't understand why I should look for theory only in you know, Weber or Durkheim, I mean, I love them, uh, but why would I not want to think that a theoretical structure, which is why they are saying this is not a question of genre, they're saying this is a question of genre, but the genre is completely defeated by the fact that a particular particle of a, gra of a grammatical construction can actually make you read that words completely differently, or it can, you know, as in one of the very famous things, the women speak in Prakrit, the men here, here in, um, in Sanskrit. And so there's a very famous thing where she uses the, you know, where this guy's passing by and you know, she's very attracted to him, the husband is away. And she uses the word divasakam, which in Prakrit just means the day, saying, you know, wait for the day to pass, um, uh, for a perfectly ordinary statement to say, you know, this is where this is, et cetera, et cetera. But the man hears it as the wretched day, because in Sanskrit, to put ikam is to say this diminutive wretched day, right? Uh, so there is a genre in a certain sense of what love poetry is like. And of course, they go a little mad saying, you know, how can you take this as a, as a kind of ideal of, um, you know, of love when it's actually obviously adulterous, et cetera, et cetera. But nobody really pays much attention to that. So there's a very interesting way in which it seems to me this issue is really at far beyond, at least in my understanding, representation. They're much more around expression, and they're much more around resonance, and they're much more around the fact that for these guys, things like metaphor and metonymy, they knew about them, but they thought these, I mean, and they have theories of them, but they thought these were lower forms of poetic expression. So the highest form is when you can take an ordinary, everyday speech and make it resonate with something very, very different. And I, it seems to me that provides a theoretical uh, structure of how to think about it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Danya Hookman, and I'm, I'm a college fellow at the Department of Germanic Languages and Literatures. And I'm also very interested in these kind of grammatical nuances of violence, and mm -hmm. particularly in the question of temporality. So it seems kind of what I'm gathering from what you're saying is that maybe a way of thinking about everyday violence is through temporality. As in the event or something, it always kind of occurs at a moment. But in all the examples that you kind of gave, it's a lingering on. So maybe thinking of naming not only as a defining, but also as a. Can you go a bit slower and a bit louder? Yeah, okay. Can you ask the question? <laughs> Throw the dart, just okay. ask the question. So the question is, if we couldn't think about um, everyday violence as a presenting, as something that always remains in the present, as opposed to an event, something that lingers on or lasts. Yes, so that was part of my, you know, part of the whole argument that the, the notion of the event provides everyday violence with one kind of picture, right? So I, I can't say that that picture is not important right, the manner in which it absorbs everyday violence, et cetera. I'm interested in that kind of level of violence, which is, in fact, not available towards naming and so on, right? Uh, for that, I think people have thought about such things as quasi-event, which nevertheless still participates in the notion of the event. And I'm trying to think over here that if it's nameless signification, then fundamentally, you know, what I try to do is to shift it somewhere um, where it doesn't look like violence at all, right? What name you give to somebody or, you know, whose name you can pronounce and whose name you cannot pronounce, and yet there is a certain kind of violence which is distilled into that. Pete. Well, thank you very much. I um, really, I just wanted to thank you, first of all, for a wonderful um, talk. 
Um, I like your approach of like the tri-dimensional approach of thinking of the everyday in terms of, as you put it, uh, the potential, the actual, and the eventual. But my question to you before uh, Baba yell, yells at me, um, how would you respond to someone, someone like um, uh, Lambert, of course, in his um, no ordinary, uh, Michael Lambert? In, in his no ordinary, ordinary ethics where he argues that by doing so, you are rendering, you are basically running the risk of making the ethical, in his own words, as intersubjectively evident. So, um, so, I have a very long piece on ordinary ethics, which is coming along with Michael Lambert's piece on ordinary ethics. You know, right? And what I describe it as mere enemy, uh, you know, which is like the Buddhist notion of uh, the idea that it's like you know, compassion and pity, rather than love and hate. Um, so I think that Michael is wrong about criteria, uh, because I think he confuses. I wish he was here because he confuses the uh, explicit criteria with a Wittgensteinian notion where it's simply how do we know this to be love? Or how do we know this to be hate? And so with, with the question of potential, actual, and eventual, which is what I used to displace the idea of past, present, and future, rather, you know, it, I think that in relation to this, one of the very interesting questions that comes up constantly is the fact that, um, you know, that, um, that the pictures of um, um, you know the pictures of the eventual um, you know constantly intrude in a certain sense on the ability to inhabit the actual, right? And that's in a certain sense a very inter interesting set of questions because of time. I I didn't take up one or two points, but one point that I really wanted to, which I make in the larger paper. Um, is this idea that in a certain sense, sometimes in relationship to very durable structures, it's the ability to inhabit the moment that stands in a certain sense against very oppressive durable structures. And I, I have an example from my field work where, um, you know, I'm sorry to keep bringing these Hindu-Muslim things uh, right now. They are very much on my mind with, uh, um, uh, so I have a very, uh, so, so this guy is describing how, how um, uh, he's very intrigued by the fact that his mother wants to buy um, vegetables only from the Bangladeshi uh, vendor. Uh, and I asked her, like, why do you not go allow other vendors to come? And she said, you know, I long for, I long for hearing him call me a mean. And it then turns out that there is this very long kind of, you know, a back story of, uh, a, you know, of a, of a kind of a love affair which never fully materialized because, of course, the guy was Muslim, she was Hindu. Um, so I was very, in it was very interesting how that, you know, that the idea in a certain sense of something which was completely left, not actualized, in some ways becomes a certain very Cupidian wish that he would call me Ami rather than everybody calls me Ma, I wish somebody would call me Ami. Then I would know what it might have been if I had married him, for example, right? Um, yeah. I want to ask you to, you know, for a couple of questions if you have them, and then I want to ask Arthur to actually come up and uh, give us his views and to thank Dina and to thank you all and bring this wonderful evening to a close till tomorrow morning, of course. Ah, can you, would you like to speak? Yes. Yeah. Um, first of all, you have to realize that virtually my entire, or almost my entire adult life has been responding to Vina Das. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and sometimes in remarkable settings. I had the great privilege of being at the, when she received the Anders Ritzius Medal uh, in Norway and before the king presented it to her to be a discussant on, on a panel. So I've had, I've had experience doing this. Since I have my own conference tomorrow and can't be present tomorrow morning, I'm going to include remarks about the ethical uh, 
because I, uh, it, it seems to me they're bound up very much in what we've seen. Now, what it's important to recognize, if you know the, uh, the range of Vina's work, is that the paper she presented, the long, long paper she presented tonight, I think is really the most consistent, coherent, uh, driving statement about her position that I have, I have read, and I've read almost everything she's written. And I think that I want to convey the power of this argument, because I think we're dealing here with one of the most important social theorists of our time. And I want to convey why she is so important. Um, now, let's use some of her own words uh, uh, to begin to get us into this uh, reflection. Um, um, she, re she, she says, I want to engage the small disciplines that ordinary people perform in their everyday life to hold life together as the quote unquote natural expression of ethics. I'm going to come back to that, uh, and I want Vina herself to respond to what exactly is meant, because I think that I myself could make the argument for what that means, but I want her to make that argument. She speaks about the everyday as taught with moments of, and, these, and this, just think how taught this is, of world-making and world-annihilating encounters that could inf unfold in a few seconds or over the course of a life world-making and world-annihilating. She talks in her un unordinary phrasing about the ordinary that it and means to represent a deep philosophical shift, which in order to understand where this is coming from, she would have had to have read the whole paper because she begins with the idea of concepts, moves from concepts into lived experience. Uh, you'd have to see the whole development. But, but let me just foreshorten things by saying, that when she uses the term poisonous knowledge, this is not simply throwing out a new uh, way of talking about things. This is meant to contrast fundamentally with the most common term used in research and theory today to talk about what she's talking about, violence, and that is traumatic memory. This is meant to be a fundamental counter to that, to traumatic memory. And in the same sense, I think that her understanding of critical patience as what ethnography is, is meant to be a, a basic statement about ethnography. And let me now draw on both of those. So th this is the way, in my view, the argument goes and why it is such an incredibly provocative uh, understanding of trauma and a actually a, a, a critique, a fundamental critique of trauma. So she begins not with the traumatized individual, but with the poisoning of everyday life, in stating as the subject, not the individual, but everyday life. The poisoning of, the, of everyday life affects the moral condition of people, not just the individual, not just the network, but of all the, all the people. In, in a sense, in my language, all the people in a local world. And it forces people to endure, withstand, manage. You don't hear the term resilience here, okay? Resilience is the, is the common term used by psychologists to, use, to deal with the idea of trauma. This is not about, this is a rejection, in my view, of the idea of resilience, okay? It is that we endure, we withstand, we manage, because that poisonous knowledge corrodes family relations to an unbearable extent so that there needs to be repair. But the repair can only itself come out of poisoned relationships. And I think that this is such a, this is a, a piece of knowledge that I can only characterize as based on everything I've seen in my life as fundamental wisdom. This is a piece of wisdom, okay? That the, the actual act of repairing, which is a need, we need to repair, can only be made out of the poisoned relationships that have already been affected. And as I read it, we have only a few ways 
uh, uh, Vina tells us, to do the repair. Now, she, again, she didn't have time tonight to review them all. There's ritual, and that's a very important uh, um, issue for her. There's love, and there's care. But these are ways to go on living, not ways that will resolve problems. The everyday is always remade out of poison and destruction. I think that is one of the great insights of her work. And you see it in many places, uh, beginning with her, with her uh, uh, papers um, uh, long before we did social suffering and remaking a world, and then through those things. And this is a, an insight almost impossible for us to work with because it is such a dark insight and yet such a human insight. Earlier, of course, uh, Vina Das was concerned with the politics of, of, of um, kinship and therefore how this affected the politics of kinship. And one might say in this case that that's the one part we didn't hear here, that it would be good to bring that forward, the politics of kinship uh, into this. Now, let me just pass to critical patience. Um, so the critical patience is the sideway glance, is the sideway glance. This is the defense of what uh, Michael Hertzfeld and Steve Caton and so many others in the audience who I associate uh, Diana Eck, good ethnography with. Um, uh, 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 this is the fact we, we don't ask questions directly necessarily. We don't use questionnaires. We don't organize our work as an interrogation, but that we are there. This is a much better notion than, quote unquote, hanging out. This is, this is, this is the sideway gaze, a sideway glance or gaze. It's, it's meant to um, engage the local world, engage the, um, the um, uh, life as she, as she as she, as, she, as she lives it, as she participates in it, and then to bring it into text, into discussion with text. And much of the paper, and you heard at the end of her talk, is an engagement with um, canonical texts of the uh, Hindu tradition. Uh, and here, I think the wonderful thing, which is anthropologically has been an ideal for us for generations, has been not to accept canonical texts from the West as the authoritative way to examine the uh, life, but to instate alternative ways of understanding that are scholarly as well as lived. And I think she does, a, um, she does exactly that. But then to bring critical thinking, the same critical thinking that she brings to a deep reading of Wittgenstein and Cavell to those texts. And, and then to put that into a, to triangulate it as it were, with ethnographers who've, who've looked at materials that have a family resemblance to what she's looking at, and to theoreticians who are important for her. And, and then to inaugurate, originate, um, uh, 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 I, I think a very, very powerfully originate, um, different ways of, of thinking about this. And so just think of, of this review of, of this notion of ethics. This is quoting Professor Das. Ethics is the expression of life taken as a whole, rather than, to, than privileging dramatic breakdown or ethical dilemmas as the occasion for ethical reflection. That's a fundamental challenge again to moral theorists, that moral theorists in the Western tradition um, uh, proceed exactly uh, via the breakdown, dramatic breakdowns in cases or ethical dilemmas. Hers is not a case. These are not cases in my view. These are slices of life. These are, she, is, she is cutting through, as it were, a cross section and giving us a feel for what is moving in time as life itself. Now this is not such a disguised way of critiquing the current fascination in social theory with states of exception 
and extreme limit conditions. Okay? So uh, for those of you unfamiliar with this, there, there's a, a great deal of attention today to the work of, uh, of Agamben and others uh, 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 concerned with the idea of an exceptional state. Professor Das is saying something else. Exceptional things happen, but the state is the ordinary. Now, um, she goes on, uh, uh, and this is a very, very important, I think, for her ethical theory. She's building, I think, a, 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 a unique ethical theory here. She says, I can see a path toward imagining that creating a space of possibilities for the other is itself a mode of living ethically. So the other, she spends a lot of time on second tense, on the other is crucial for our lived experience. But it is not an alienated other. It's not an other, um, let's say, that Vince Crapanzano has spoken to that is impenetrable. It's not uh, in a psychoanalytic sense. It's not the um, uh, exoticized other of, um, uh, of um, uh, uh, Orientalism. It's the other as those around me. And she uses an, an extraordinarily interesting way of putting this, which I, 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 we need to hear from her about, which is that it's the other who I am fated to live with. The word fate appears frequently in this. It's the other who, who in, in, in contiguity with me, in, in contingency with me, I am fated to live with. And so I think it's very, very important to understand from her better what that is. Um, uh, and again, uh, on, on moral theory, I submit that the, this is, these are her, her words, I submit that the usual paths that moral theory takes with its ought and should simply do not suffice. The paths to a moral life do not lie here in either rule following or in taking recourse to technologies of self-making, but rather in the attentiveness through which one ties one's own fate to that of the other. Okay? I think that's the core of this ethical theory, and we want to really hear her um, say more about it. Um, now, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I would not be a, um, a, um, a lifetime conversationalist with her if it weren't for the fact that I also ho hold some of my own ideas and I, 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 uh, uh, I, I have, a, I have some, some queries uh, and maybe even a little um, concerns. Um, so the one I, I, I already re registered was the political. I want to hear more of the political. Political in several senses. Political in Jim Scott's sense of the infopolitics of everyday life, but the political even in a big sense. Um, and, and, and you yourself referred to that when you said that you're preoccupied now with Hindu-Muslim relations, that politically in India this is a crucial time for that. Secondly, I feel that one person left out, which is surprising, since in a recent uh, um, a, a survey of the most cited people in anthropology, Foucault came first, okay, still. And remember that Foucault early on, the early Foucault, wrote les mots et les choses. We translate that as the order of things, but actually it's words and things, okay? Words and things. And this is what your, your work with categories is all about. I felt we, we could have heard a little of Foucault in this part, especially again as it relates to the political. And indeed, you know, this would, be a, would have been a perfect place, in my view, to have brought in biopower. Um, now, doesn't the argument end up, in a way, on the emphasis on relationships itself have the possibility of a misrecognition in the same way that we contrast the hyper-individualism of the West and the um, sociocentric orientation of the non-Western world. Isn't there a danger of, of a bipolar understanding that misses what is so subtle and eloquent in the rest of your writing? So you really have to tell us about the other, who, more about the other. Um, now the last point I want to make is that 
Wiener is not the first by any means to attempt to indigenize social theory. And um, there was a great, for those of you who are China scholars like me, you know that uh, Michael Pewitt, a great China scholar, you, Michael knows that in the 1960s and 70s, um, Yang Guoshu and Wang Guangguo in Taiwan attempted to do what they called sinicize social theory. And they suggested that um, uh, uh, Guanxi, the Chinese idea of connections, was just as significant as social class and, soci and social status uh, uh, developed uh, in the West. So in, in, in the indigenization that I see you doing, in the Indianization of social theory, which I applaud, I completely applaud, I, I think it would be also be interesting for you to rel relate that to other attempts to do this, which, which emphasize different things. And for example, it would work very well with your naming, because in the Chinese tradition, the rectification of names is one of the central issues, though Michael knows much more about that than me. So having concluded, I, I would just say this, um, that um, uh, uh, everyone should read the paper, in, in the audience should read the paper she wrote, because it, uh, it is the clearest and fullest exposition of a, of a lifetime of thinking about life. And I think it is one of the most extraordinary and resonant statements that I I have engaged, and it has been a privilege for me to be your lifetime collaborator and uh, respondent. Thank you. Thank you. Right.